Well, good evening. My name is Justin Barnard, and again, I am Associate Dean in the Institute for Intellectual Discipleship, which is one of the sponsoring organizations on this campus of this particular series. I also serve here at Union University as Associate Professor of Philosophy in the Honors Community, and it is my great privilege and pleasure to welcome all of you to this second evening in this series of lectures celebrating the life and legacy of C.S. Lewis. Those who are generally familiar with Lewis typically associate him either with his apologetics or with his famous series, The Chronicles of Narnia. However, as I said last week when we began, it is the burden of this particular series to provide a window into the wider scope of Lewis's interests and also his writings. Perhaps surprisingly, those interests on Lewis's part included science. That's perhaps not the first thing that comes to mind when people picture Lewis as the great literary scholar that he was. And in addition to science, Lewis was also deeply interested in the nature of education. And tonight, I am pleased that our two speakers this evening will be dealing with Lewis's perspectives on both topics. Interestingly, Lewis dealt with both science and education in a single series of lectures that became his famous small book called The Abolition of Man. This was not by any means the only place where Lewis wrote about science and education, but it is certainly among the more noteworthy of his many books where he deals with these two topics. The nature of education, especially of the young, is one of the primary concerns of this book, The Abolition of Man. But Lewis situates his concerns about the education of children in the broader context of a worldview that he called naturalism. Lewis defined naturalism as the view simply that nature is all that exists. So nature is all that is part of reality. No supernatural, no gods, no God, no angels, just the natural world. And Lewis rightly worried that the philosophical trajectory of the late 19th and 20th century had established naturalism as the prevailing view in the West. I think he was right about this. Hence, all education would be based on naturalistic assumptions. That was really his deep concern. And in The Abolition of Man, Lewis ponders the consequences of a thoroughly naturalistic education, arguing quite famously that a naturalistic view of human beings and of education tends to produce what he called men without chests. That is, students who utterly lack the stable sentiments that are essential to moral virtue. And I'm hopeful that we'll hear more about that in our second lecture tonight. Beyond this, Lewis worried that in the absence of cultivated moral virtue, society would ultimately be governed by science where science would primarily be understood in terms of controlling nature by means of technology. Now, quite shockingly, I think, this led Lewis to suggest at the abolition of man that science so conceived, that is to say, if you conceive of science as simply controlling nature by means of technology, was basically magic. Only he thought science was more successful than magic. Now, despite how this sounds, Lewis was not a foe of genuine science. Though let me suggest that if you want to cultivate friends in the sciences, it might be good to refrain from saying things like, you're just a magician with better tricks. Still, what Lewis said about science is difficult to parse if you look at the whole of his writings. This is because he approached science both as a non-scientist and perhaps as importantly, as a philosopher. Consequently, whenever Lewis thought about science, he pondered the larger philosophical assumptions in which science was embedded and the implications that those assumptions might have for culture at large. This is why tonight I am simply delighted 
that our first speaker brings both scientific expertise and philosophical acumen to Lewis's understanding of science. Dr. Jennifer Grinke is professor of biology and director of the Hammond Center for Scientific Studies here at Union University. She holds an undergraduate degree in biology from Bryan College, just across the state, and a PhD in cell biology from the University of Virginia. Dr. Grinke is interested in the intersection of science, philosophy, and theology, and she has a special fondness for the medieval philosopher Thomas Aquinas. Perhaps we'll even hear some references to Thomas Aquinas tonight. I've been wondering this afternoon whether it's better to describe Dr. Grinke as a philosophical scientist or a scientific philosopher. Perhaps she will resolve this puzzle or perhaps it's best to live with the mystery. Either way, I know that we are all in for a treat as Dr. Grinke comes to present what would C.S. Lewis think about the ID movement and biologos, an analysis of the debate on Lewis's views of science. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Grinke. Good evening. <clears throat> well, now, 50 years after Lewis's death, um, C.S. Lewis is loved and trusted by a broad swath of Christians today. To the extent that one commentator writing Christianity Today calls Lewis a theological Elvis Presley, the rock star of the Christian world. Because of this, um, Christians are interested in what Lewis thought about various issues, and for many, if Lewis held a position that gives that position the good housekeeping seal of approval, I'm going to talk this evening about two groups that disagree with each other about how we should approach science and in particular evolution. Uh, but despite their disagreements with each other, both claim Lewis would have agreed with them. Uh, so the narrow question I'm asking tonight is what would Lewis have thought about these two groups approach to science? And the broader question is how did Lewis approach science in general? Um, the first group, Biologos. Uh, promotes what's commonly called theistic evolution. They generally prefer the term evolutionary creationism to theistic evolution because it puts the emphasis on creation rather than evolution. They also put an emphasis on being evangelical Christians. This would be counterintuitive to a Southern Baptist crowd uh, who on average are evangelical but not um, evolutionists. Uh, but I think it does make sense to think of the Biologos crowd as evangelicals. In a sense, their entire organization is primarily aimed at converting people to Christianity and especially to keeping young people in the church. Their goal is to provide a space for people who are convinced mainstream evolutionary science is true to be or remain evangelical Christians. They cite statistics about young people who are raised in the church, go off to college, become convinced that evolution is true, and then have this crisis of faith where they have to choose between their science and their faith. You can go on their website and read lots of testimonials of people who um, feel like their faith was saved by Biologos' his organization. Biologos was founded by Francis Collins, who's an evangelical Christian who came to faith as an adult. Um, he's known for his work on the human genome and is now the director of the NIH. So he's one of the most prominent scientists in the U.S., um, even aside from being a, a Christian um, or scientists who are Christians. He has written this book, The Language of God, um, in which he gives his testimony. Um, and here is Francis Collins giving an address for the Veritas Forum in a really cool DNA tie. Um, he, <laughs> he here is um, giving his testimony, and let's take a look at what he has to say. Get this to work. So that troubled me, and I thought about it a little bit and realized what the problem was. I was a scientist, or at least I thought I was, and scientists are supposed to make decisions after they look at the data, after they look at the evidence. I had made a decision that there was no God, 
and I'd never really thought about looking at the evidence. That didn't seem like a good thing. It was the decision that I wanted the answer to be, but I had to admit I didn't really know whether I had chosen the answer on the basis of reason or whether because it was a convenient form of uh, perhaps willful blindness uh, to the evidence. I wasn't sure there was any evidence, but I figured I'd better go find out because I didn't want to be in that spot again. So what did I do? Well, you know, I figured there are those world religions. What do they believe? I'd better find out. And I tried to read through some of those sacred texts, and I got totally confused and frustrated. And there was no Wikipedia to help me either. <laughs> it's much easier now. <laughs> There's even a book on the shelf called World Religions for Dummies, but they didn't have that then either. So at a loss, I knocked on the door of a minister who lived down the road from me in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and said, I don't know what these people are talking about, but I figure it's time for me to learn. So, okay, you must be a believer. At least I hope you are. You're a minister. <laughs> Let me ask you some questions. So I asked him a bunch of probably blasphemous questions, and he was gracious about that. And after a while said, you know, you're on a journey here trying to figure out what's true. You're not the first one. And in fact, I've got a book here written by somebody who went on that same journey from an academic perspective. In fact, it was a pretty distinguished Oxford scholar. He found around him there were people who were believers, and he was puzzled about that. And he set about to try to figure out why people believe and figured that he could shoot them down and, well, why don't you read the book and see what happened? So he pulled this little book off the shelf and I took it home and began to read. And in the first two or three pages, I realized that my arguments against faith were really those of a schoolboy. They had no real substance. And the thoughtful reflections of this Oxford scholar, whose name, of course, is C.S. Lewis, uh, made me realize there was a great depth of thinking and reason that could be applied to the question of God. And that was a surprise. I had imagined faith and reason were at opposite poles. And here was this deep intellectual who was convincing me quickly, page by page, that actually reason and faith go hand in hand, though faith has the added uh, component of revelation. Well, I had to learn more about that. Over the course of the next year, kicking and screaming most of the way, because I did not want this to turn out the way that it seemed to be turning out, I began to realize that the evidence uh, for the existence of God, while not proof, was actually pretty interesting. And it certainly made me realize that atheism would no longer be for me an acceptable choice, that it was the least rational so we have Francis Collins, the rational scientist, becoming a Christian after reading Mere Christianity. So even if you're one of many Southern Baptists who are convinced that mainstream science is wrong about evolution, um, a point of agreement you might have with Biologos um, is a high value on evangelism. I have a story to illustrate that. Um, some years ago, a friend who had been witnessing to his father for many years asked me for pointers in arguing against evolution with the idea that if he could just convince his father that evolution was wrong, he would become a Christian. Uh, my reply was, you know, there are Christians who believe in evolution. And he said, I never thought of that. Um, and so for many people who have, again, not thought of that, um, you can think back to last week, um, Dr. Fant's description of missionaries using stories within a culture to connect Christianity with their culture. So for some people, their culture is um, evolutionary biology, like Francis Collins. It makes sense to be able to point them to Christians who are working within the evolutionary story, if only because there are non-Christians out there who are deeply committed to evolution and can't imagine giving it up. So our next organization is the Discovery Institute. This is a group that promotes, among other things, intelligent design, which is often abbreviated just ID. And intelligent design proponents take the approach of using scientific arguments to argue against Darwinian evolution. So you can see right there that they're in opposition to Biologos. 
and they argue for the existence of an intelligent designer behind nature, especially in biology. Um, ID supporters are mostly Christians, but they are adamant that their arguments are not explicitly Christian or even explicitly theistic. They're just arguing for an intelligent designer. One of the main intelligent design arguments is found in Michael Behe's book. Here is Michael Behe, he's a professor at Lehigh. Um, this is his faculty photo, and I have actually the, the original edition with the original cover, and you can see there's a gargoyle over his shoulder reading that book in his, his faculty photo. Uh, it's a pretty well-known book. Um, Behe is a biochemist, and he argues in this book that at the biochemical level, biological systems are irreducibly complex. That is, the molecular structures, say, of, oops, sorry, a um, bacterial flagellum involves lots of little parts that are absolutely necessary for its function. If one part isn't there, the whole doesn't function, and so there is no advantage to involving each little part slowly and gradually. This is an argument specifically against Darwinian natural selection. Behe says that he doesn't have a problem with common descent, the idea that all species are descended from a common ancestor. Um, like Biologos, um, ID proponents are also concerned about evangelism. In particular, they see the future downfall of evolution as taking away a major prop to atheism. And to show you what I mean, I have here William Dembski, who's a major figure in the intelligent design movement, um, and here he is debating some years ago Christopher Hitchens, who's a fairly well-known atheist. Um, and of course, they're debating the existence of God. Christopher Hitchens has just given his arguments um, against the existence of God, and here is William Dembski arguing. Well, I could rehearse standard arguments for God's existence, I want in this debate to take a different tack. Christopher Hitchens disbelieves in God's existence. Why? Lack of evidence and evils perpetrated in the name of religion, he says. In his book, God is Not Great, reveals a more basic reason. Hitchens, as a scientific reductionist, believes science has given us new knowledge and that it destroys religious faith. What is this new knowledge? According to Hitchens, it is Darwinian evolution. You may ask what a chapter on evolution is doing in a book defending atheism. At the end of that chapter, Hitchens explains, quote, we no longer have any need of a God to explain what is no longer mysterious. Let this sink in. Religion, according to Hitchens, renders biological origins mysterious. But now that Darwin has come and shown how natural selection explains biological origins, all is clear. Fellow atheist Richard Dawkins put it more memorably. Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. It's no coincidence that Richard Dawkins, the world's best known atheist, is also an evolutionary biologist. Atheists, like everyone else, need a creation story. Without God in the picture, something like Darwinian evolution has to be true. And so Hitchens, though a humanities guy, lectures his readers on proofs of evolution. So we have here um, the idea of um, uh, Darwinian evolution allowing for intellectually fulfilled atheism. And so William Dembski and um, intelligent design proponents would like to take away um, that um, argument or prop to atheism. So we have here two different approaches to science. Um, Biologos tends to emphasize current conclusions of science, um, in particular because they, they make an argument from authority that the people who are experts in a particular field are the most likely to know what's true in that field, therefore we ought to listen to the evolutionary biologists because they're the experts. Um, Biologos emphasizes um, the laws of nature, and in particular, they like to emphasize the idea of God sustaining the laws of nature so that God is involved in everything that's happening according to laws of nature um, through this sustaining force or power. Um, on the flip side, proponents of intelligent design tend to emphasize the process of science over the current conclusions, and they emphasize the changing nature of science. And of course, 
That's because they're hoping to precipitate a change using those pro the process of science, those methods. Uh, points of agreement, both groups consider science to be an important source of truth, but not the only source of truth. So moving on to the debate here about Lewis. In April 2011, Biologos published a blog series on the topic, C.S. Lewis on Evolution and Intelligent Design. This was written by Michael Peterson. The series had originally been written as an article published in Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith, and there's Peterson. Uh, Peterson's a philosopher specializing in philosophy of religion at Asbury University and Seminary. He's written a number of books about faith and science and is working on a book on the philosophy of C.S. Lewis. Peterson gives three main arguments for why he thinks Lewis would reject the ID movement and then argues that Lewis accepted mainstream evolution. So we're going to take those three and then the fourth point in turn. Um, Peterson's first argument is that while Lewis is well known as an apologist, he never used design-based arguments for the existence of God. You may be familiar with Paley's watchmaker argument for the existence of God. If you found a watch lying on the ground, you wouldn't think it had just happened. You'd assume it was designed and made by someone. Nature is even more complex and intricate than the works of a watch. Therefore, we should infer the existence of God from the existence of this complexity in nature. Lewis actually was not a fan of Paley's argument, and um, Peterson also cites the introduction to Lewis's problem of pain here. Um, this is Lewis. Not many years ago, when I was an atheist, if anyone had asked me, why do you not believe in God? My reply would have run something like this. Look at the universe we live in. By far the greatest part of it consists of empty space, completely dark and unimaginably cold. If you ask me to believe this is the work of a benevolent and omnipotent spirit, I reply that all the evidence points in the opposite direction. Either there's no spirit behind the universe or else a spirit indifferent to good and evil or else an evil spirit. Lewis sometimes calls this argument for atheism the argument from undesign. And even after he became a Christian, he didn't like Paley's argument. Intelligent design arguments are not exactly the same, but they're pretty similar, thus Peterson thinks Lewis would not have liked uh, ID arguments. And we'll come back to this um, when the response comes from the other side. Um, second, Peterson criticizes intelligent design's rejection of mainstream science, quote unquote, and endorses methodological naturalism for science. Methodological naturalism is the idea that scientists ought to restrict themselves to natural explanations. Um, he argues that Lewis would do the same and supports this with a quote from Mere Christianity. I'm going to read the longer quote, and the, the key part of it is up here. This is Lewis. Science works by experiments. It watches how things behave. Every scientific statement in the long run, however complicated it looks, it really means something like, I pointed the telescope to such and such a part of the sky at 2.20 a.m. on January 15th and saw so-and-so. Or I put some of this stuff in a pot, he's not a scientist, and heated it to such and such a temperature and it did so-and-so. He's really not a scientist. Do not think I am saying anything against science, I'm only saying what its job is. And the more scientific a man is, the more I believe he would agree with me that this is the job of science, and a very useful and necessary job it is, too. But why anything comes to be there at all, and whether there's anything behind the things science observes, something of a different kind. This is not a scientific question. If there is something behind, then either it will have to remain altogether unknown to men, or else make itself known in some different way. The statement that there is any such thing and the statement that there is no such thing are neither of them statements that science can make. And real science do, scientists do not usually make them. It's usually the journalists and popular novelists who have picked up a few odds and ends of half-baked science from textbooks who go in for them. After all, it really is a matter of common sense, supposing science ever became complete so that it knew every single thing in the whole universe. Is it not plain that the questions, why is there a universe? Why does it go on as it does? Has it any meaning? Would remain just as they were? 
Um, so this seems a fair enough argument. At least in this passage, Lewis does seem to be making a distinction between questions of meaning and purpose and something behind on the one hand and scientific observations on the other. The key part of this for Peterson is the statement that science can't tell us whether there is something behind nature and this is what he thinks that ID proponents are trying to do. Um, third, Peterson thinks intelligent design proponents have a God of the gaps problem. And this is a fairly common complaint against um, uh, uh, intelligent design. That is, they think of causality primarily in terms of scientific causality. What physically caused something to happen. And therefore, if something has a natural cause, like natural selection, God wasn't involved. Thus, according to Peterson, ID proponents are forced to limit God to the gaps in our explanation. Peterson prefers to talk about layers of causality. For those of you who've taken philosophy, Aristotle's four causes. In the scheme, the concept of a cause is broader than it is in ordinary English usage. And considering the causes of a statue of Achilles, Aristotle called the chunk of marble the material cause. The sculptor who chipped away the excess marble, the efficient cause, the design of the statue in the mind of the designer, um, the formal cause, and the glorification of Achilles as the final cause. It's this last cause, the purpose of something that Peterson ascribes in particular to God, even as he describes evolution as the actual actor, the sculptor that makes things happen. Uh, in a minute. Um, Lewis would have, I think, understood Aristotle's four causes, and at, in at least one of his letters described himself as an Aristotelian. So it's fair to say that Lewis probably would have recognized that something can have these layers of causes. But it's not clear to me that ID is necessarily in conflict with this concept of layers of causality. They're arguing that there are problems with one particular efficient cause, namely Darwinian natural selection, and they don't insist that the gap be filled with God. So they could have um, their complaints about this efficient cause um, while there still is another formal cause on another layer, so to speak. So these are Peterson's three arguments that Lewis would reject the ID movement. First, that Lewis doesn't see design as evidence for the existence of God. Second, that Lewis separates scientific questions from questions of meaning, what Peterson calls methodological naturalism. And third, that Lewis would have rejected intelligent design on the grounds that it limits God to explanatory gaps. So fourth, Peterson um, argues then that Lewis supported evolution. He makes a pretty strong statement here at the top. Lewis accepted both cosmic and biological evolution as highly confirmed in scientific theories. <clears throat> and he supports this with a quote from the problem of pain. So this is Lewis. That man is physically descended from animals, I have no objection. For centuries, God perfected the animal form, which was to become the vehicle of humanity in the image of himself. The creature may have existed for ages in this state before it became man. In the fullness of time, God caused to descend upon this organism a new kind of consciousness, which could say I and me, which knew God and could make judgments of truth, beauty, and goodness. <coughs> However, if you uh, look at this in the problem of pain, immediately before this, Lewis proposes this as a not unlikely tale and that seems a much lower level of confidence than highly confirmed. So I'm, I'm not particularly convinced by this argument. Peterson then um, goes on to talk about Lewis's views of naturalism. Um, and he has this fairly lengthy section at the end of his paper encouraging his readers to reject philosophical naturalism and to distinguish it from methodological naturalism. Lewis, of course, clearly rejects philosophical naturalism. As far as I know, no one's disputing this. It's clear, though, that Peterson thinks that Lewis's rejection of naturalism is just as important as his acceptance of evolution. So now we're moving on to the response from the Discovery Institute. They responded a little over a year after the Biologo series went up. Um, not just with an article or blog series, but this entire book. It's a pretty good-sized book, too. Um, the title 
The Magician's Twin is a reference to Lewis's Abolition of Man that Dr. Barnard mentioned before, which he describes science and magic as twins. One was sickly and died, and the other grew. The thing magic and science have in common, according to Lewis, is that both are aimed at control of the world, at power. In the case of science, it leads to technology which allows greater control of some people, of, of, of some people over others, and Lewis sees this as um, problematic. So it's a bit of an odd choice for a title, I think, since it's not a particularly positive view of science, and the Discovery Institute is actually very positive not only about science but about technology. In addition to the Center for Science and Culture, which promotes intelligent design, the Discovery Institute includes the Technology and Democracy Project that promotes reducing restrictions on technology. But there it is, that's the title. The editor is John G. West. His um, academic background is in political science. He's brought together a very impressive list of contributors. Edward J. Larson is the author of a very well-known book on the Scopes trial called Summer for the Gods. It won a Pulitzer. Um, Michael Eshleman has written a well-respected academic book on Lewis's view of science. And C. John Collins is an Old Testament scholar who's well-known for writing on Genesis and evolution, in particular on historical Adam. So there's lots of interesting things here. And of course, I don't have time to talk about the whole book because West, the editor, addresses the Peterson article most directly. I'm gonna focus on his work, but if you're interested in the topic, um, the other authors have some interesting chapters as well. Even limiting myself to West chapters, I'm gonna to have to be a little selective in which arguments I discuss, but I tried to focus on the things that seem to be most important to him. So he's going to be responding to Peterson's arguments here. Uh, first, West points out rightly, I think, that Peterson is overstating Lewis's acceptance of evolution in saying that Lewis considered evolution to be highly confirmed. And West points specifically to Peterson's omission of Lewis's soft peddling on evolution in mere Christianity. And to show you what I mean here, I have the two quotes. The top quote is Peterson's quote of Lewis. Um, he says, perhaps a modern man can understand the Christian idea of transformation, that's the, in the context, best if he takes it in connection with evolution. Everyone now knows that man has evolved from lower types of life. Consequently, people often wonder, what is the next step? When is the next thing beyond man going to appear? The text without the ellipses, which is um, below, includes a parenthetical that was omitted, in which Lewis says, everyone after, everyone now knows about evolution, in parentheses, though of course some educated people disbelieve it. So he's pulling back here on saying, well, everybody ought to believe, about, ought to believe evolution. Um, Lewis actually added this parenthetical into the written text. Mere Christianity was originally um, given as a radio address. Um, interestingly, this is one of the few parts of the Mere Christianity radio address that still exists today because we heard from Francis Collins and William Dembski, I thought it'd be fun to hear Lewis's voice as well. So this is Lewis reading this passage. Now, let's just for Christianity, as I think, has the real answer to a question a lot of modern people are asking. Everyone's heard of evolution, how men evolve from lower types of life. And people often ask, what's the next step? When is the thing beyond man going to appear? Some imaginative writers even try to picture what the next step will be like, but they usually end in nonsense about men with six arms or wings or something of that kind. But the Christians think those people are on the wrong tack. The next step has already appeared. The next step is from being mere creatures to being sons of God. The new kind of man appeared in Christ. So you can tell from the larger context there that Lewis is using this um, as an illustration or an analogy, um, progress in evolution um, with true moral progress, moral progress towards um, being more like Christ. 
Uh, to be fair to Peterson, he isn't using this quote directly as evidence that Lewis accepts evolution. He's using the analogy as, the, as an example of a pious use of evolution, but the full quote undermines his earlier claim that Lewis thought evolution was highly confirmed. Um, next, West points out that the word evolution is used to mean different things, and he's quite right about that. He attempts to separate out just what aspects of evolution Lewis accepted and rejected. So he has three kinds of evolution here. Um, first, evolution as common descent, the idea that all life is descended from a common ancestor. Well, many people conflate this idea with Darwinian evolution. Um, the idea of common descent predates Darwin by quite a bit. Um, second, uh, evolution as unguided natural selection acting on random variation. This is the mechanism for common descent proposed by Darwin in The Origin of Species. The third is evolution as a philosophy. So taking these in order, West first agrees with Peterson that Lewis accepted at least the possibility of common descent. Um, on the second sense of evolution, West is going to part ways with Peterson. He argues that Lewis rejected natural selection as a mechanism for the origin of different species. So West's case here is based on favorable comments that Lewis made about um, Henri Bergson, and in particular his book entitled Creative Evolution. Bergson was a philosopher and offered a philosophical approach to evolution that he considered a third way between a mechanistic approach to evolution and a goal-directed one. It involved a force that he called the elan vital, or vital impulse that drives life in its evolution. This is obviously different from standard Darwinian evolution in which natural selection acting on mutation is the only force driving evolution. So West cites marginalia in Lewis's copy of Bergson's book in which Lewis agrees with some of Bergson's critiques of natural selection as the only driving force of evolution. West also cites other books that Lewis liked that criticized Darwinian evolution. So this is a fairly difficult argument for me to critique since I don't have access to these sources. Um, Lewis's books are um, in a library where you can go um, read the uh, what Lewis wrote in the margins, um, and we don't have that. But at the very least, it seems that Lewis was positively disposed towards academic critiques of Darwin. Bergson was, though, pretty mainstream. He won the 1927 Nobel Prize in Literature, in large part because of his book on evolution. And so I suspect the Biologos folks would point to this and say that Bergson was working within the academic culture of the time. The closest we come, and this again is from West, to a published critique of natural selection was from Lewis in Miracles, in which he points out that natural selection can't explain truth-seeking human rationality. Darwin himself famously worried about this problem in his autobiography, and this is Darwin. The horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust the convictions of a monkey's mind, if there are any convictions in such a mind? Uh, West points out that Lewis underlined this section of Darwin. It's a fairly famous passage in his autobiography. Lewis's version of this argument in Miracles goes like this. For the naturalist, the type of mental behavior we now call rational thinking must therefore have been evolved by natural selection, by the gradual weeding out of types less fitted to survive. Once then, our thoughts were not rational. That is, all our thoughts were, as many of our thoughts are, merely subjective events, not apprehensions of objective truth. Those which had a cause external to ourselves at all were, like our pain's responses to stimuli. Now, natural selection could operate only by eliminating responses that were biologically hurtful and multiplying those which were tended to survival. But it's not conceivable that any improvement of responses could ever turn them into acts of insight or even remotely tend to do so. So well, Peterson takes Lewis's use of this argument as his critique of naturalism as a philosophy, West takes it as a critique of the Darwinian mechanism of natural selection. 
West thinks that Lewis's recognition of this problem means that he rejected Darwin's natural selection entirely. This seems less than definitive to me since Darwin recognized the problem, he didn't repudiate natural selection. Um, but I think to a certain extent here, Peterson and West are talking past each other. West does not see how Peterson can reject naturalism and still accept Darwinian evolution. And that brings us to uh, the third point here, um, uh, evolution in, as a philosophy. Peterson um, clearly thinks that Lewis rejected evolutionism or evolution as a philosophy, and here West agrees. But he goes on to say that he thinks Lewis's distinction between evolution and evolutionism was somewhat artificial. He then goes on to argue that Lewis changed his mind about this distinction. He bases this on a letter that Lewis sent to the anti-evolutionist Bernard Ackworth. Ackworth sent Lewis a copy of a book, an anti-evolution book, that he had written but not yet published. And here is Lewis's response. I must confess it has shaken me, not in my belief in evolution, which was of the vaguest and most intermittent kind, but in my belief that the question was wholly unimportant. I wish I were younger. What inclines me now to think that you may be right in regarding it as the central and radical lie in the whole web of falsehood that now governs our lives is not so much your arguments against it as the fanatical and twisted attitudes of its defenders. So Lewis here seems to think the question of evolution more important than he did before and describes it in pretty negative terms. In particular, his concern about the attitudes of the defenders of evolution is pretty friendly to ID proponents since one of their main complaints is that evolution defenders are not being fair to their arguments. However, um, Ackworth wrote back asking Lewis to write a preface to that anti-evolution book. And here is Lewis's reply. No, I'm afraid I should lose much and you would gain almost nothing by my writing you a preface. No one who is in doubt about your views of Darwin would be impressed by testimony from me, who am known to be no scientist. Many who have been or are being moved towards Christianity by my books would be deterred by finding that I was connected with anti-Darwinism. I hope, but who knows himself, that I would not allow myself to be influenced by this consideration if it were only my personal concerns as an author that were endangered. But the cause I stand for would be endangered too. When a man has become a popular apologist, he much must watch his step. Everyone is on the lookout for things that might discredit him. Sorry. So Lewis here still doesn't think that evolution is worth criticizing publicly, even if he thinks there's something problematic there. And that, of course, is more friendly to the biologos side. Um, West next addresses Peterson's claim that Lewis didn't like theological arguments from design by coming up with an even stronger quote from Lewis that would seem initially to be against his, his side. I, I, this is Lewis. I still think the argument from design, the weakest possible ground for theism, I and mean, what may be called the argument from undesign, the strongest for atheism. Um, but West then goes on to say that Lewis did eventually embrace what he calls design friendly arguments here. Lewis does make arguments quite frequently that there seemed to be something beyond this world, that, for example, the existence of a moral law points to a lawgiver. The place where this looks most like an argument from design is in the essay, Two Lectures and God in the Dock. Lewis is talking about technological progress and says, you have to go outside the sequence of engines into the world of men to find the real originator of the rocket. So the idea is even though it looks like there's a natural progress, there's something outside of it. It is not equally reasonable to look, or is it not equally reasonable to look outside nature for the real originator of the natural order? West is here making the case that even though Lewis said that he does not like arguments from design, he did make some arguments um, that seem to be design type arguments. Note that this quote is not quite an argument for God, but for a source of um, the natural order. He, he capitalizes originator, which might make you think that he's talking about God, but he also capitalizes rocket. So I think it's just something that they did back then. Um, that may be why Lewis says he doesn't like design type arguments. He means design type arguments for the existence of God, not arguments for the existence of any design in nature. 
West goes on in, to criticize Peterson for failing to understand that intelligent design arguments are not arguments for the existence of God, but only for the existence of an intelligent designer. I think this is actually a pretty good response to Peterson's criticism. Okay, so you may now, oh sorry, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, you may be wondering who's right and who's wrong. Um, to be fair to both of them, there's a sense in which, which they both get something right. Um, the most obvious point of, hang on a sec. Most obvious point of agreement between Lewis and both these groups is the importance of apologetics, uh, evangelism to the rationalist among us. Um, Peterson's best argument against Lewis's support of intelligent design is that in the vast majority of his writings, Lewis doesn't think that evolution is something to fight and argue against in the way that the ID proponents do. West's best arguments for Lewis's supportive ID is that Lewis did use arguments for a rational source of the natural order. So Lewis apparently didn't see a conflict between believing in an intelligent designer and believing in evolution in the same way that the two of them do. And I think that's one point of difference between Lewis and both of them. Um, in the sense in which they are both wrong. Um, let's see. Um, going back to uh, the two views of science. Lewis is, I think, somewhere in the middle between emphasizing the conclusions of science, like by Logos, and emphasizing the changeable nature of science, like the intelligent design proponents. I think on this point, most scientists agree with Lewis um, we have these conclusions for now, but we realize they might change in the future. And that, I think, is, is Lewis's general approach. I think the biggest point of disagreement between Lewis and these two groups is that for Lewis, is that Lewis, I'm going to argue, doesn't think that science is a particularly important way to know truth. Lewis also disagreed that God works through general laws of nature, and that's something that's emphasized by Biologos, but I think it's something many ID proponents uh, would agree with even if they don't emphasize it. The idea of laws of nature is something that's generally considered pretty uh, central to science. So um, moving on, and this is me rather than the two different groups, um, let's look at what Lewis said of, or, or thought about science. I think it's first worth pointing out that Lewis was at least in some sense a Platonist. Um, fans of Narnia will recognize this quote from the old professor who owned the wardrobe. It's all in Plato, all in Plato. Bless me, what do they teach them at these schools? Um, Plato described this world, the world, uh, material world, as a shadow of a more real world that we currently don't have direct access to. To continue Plato's analogy, for a Platonist, science studies the shadows, not the real world. In Letters to Malcolm, Lewis compares the material world to a painted sage stage set. And I found one there that has wrinkles in it so that you can see it's a piece of canvas that's painted to look like um, a garden in a house. Um, Lewis cautions against thinking of matter as an ultimate reality and instead thinks of it as a facade. This is Lewis. Do you see? A lie is a delusion only so long as we believe it but a recognized lie as a reality, a real lie, and as such may be highly instructive. A dream ceases to be a delusion as soon as we wake, but it does not become a non-entity. It's a real dream, and it also may be instructive. A stage set is not a real wood or drawing room, it's a real stage set, and it may be a good one. In fact, we should never ask if anything is it real, for everything is real. A proper question is a real what? Uh, a little further down, he says, I have called my material surroundings a stage set. A stage set is not a dream nor a non-entity, but if you attack a stage house with a chisel, you will not get chips of brick or stone. You'll only get a hole in a piece of canvas and beyond that windy darkness. Similarly, if you start investigating the nature of matter, you will not find anything like what imagination has always supposed matter to be. You will get mathematics. This is where I think Lewis's view of science parts ways with both biologos and proponents of ID. Lewis takes the physical world a lot less seriously than do they, and therefore doesn't have as much reason to think that the study of the material world is as important as they do. 
I suspect that many modern Christians would call Lewis's views of matter Gnostic. Uh, he describes his views of heaven in terms of memories glorified and anticipates this objection. But this, you protest, is no resurrection of the body. They're not real. Surely neither less nor more real than those you've always known? You know better than I that the real world, quote unquote, of our present experience has no place in the world described by physics or even by physiology. Matter enters our experience only by becoming sensation when we perceive it or conception when we understand it, that is by becoming soul. That element in the soul which it becomes will, in my view, be raised and glorified. The hills and valleys of heaven will be to those you now experience, not as a copy to an original, nor as a substitute to the genuine article, but as the flower to the root or the diamond to the coal. It will be eternally true that they originated with matter and therefore, uh, let us therefore bless matter. But in entering our soul as alone it can enter, that is by being perceived and known, matter has turned into soul. Lewis is here willing to bless matter, not because studying matter brings us closer to the creator of matter, but because we use matter to sense and perceive a higher reality. Matter is here for Lewis, an instrumental good that will pass away. He's not opposed to studying it, but neither is it terribly important for its own sake. Notice that Lewis also privileges imagination, which Dr. Poe talked about last week, over science. While Lewis's approach to the material world would be expected to discourage him from thinking of science as studying something very important, he doesn't say this explicitly, and so I don't want to draw hard and fast conclusions from that, but I think there's further evidence that Lewis, while not anti-science, did think in ways that were um, not very friendly to a scientific approach to the world. In the same book, Letters to Malcolm, he explicitly rejects the idea that God works through general laws. You remember um, Biologos put the emphasis on natural law. Uh, and science depends to a certain extent on the ideas of laws of nature. This is Lewis. How should the true creator work by general laws? To generalize is to be an idiot, said Blake. Perhaps he went too far. But to generalize is to be a finite mind. Generalities are the lenses with which our intellects have to make do. How should God sully the infinite lucidity of this vision with such makeshifts? One might as well think he had to consult books of reference or that if he ever considered me individually, he would begin by saying, Gabriel, bring me Mr. Lewis's file. I will not believe in the managerial God and his general laws. If there is providence at all, everything is providential and every providence is a special providence. Of course, one can be a scientist and believe that what appears to be matter and energy behaving according to the laws of nature is really God being regular in his particularities. But this is not the way most scientists think. They think that there actually are laws of nature. I think the strongest evidence of Lewis's non-scientific stance towards the world comes at the end of one of his more academic books, The Discarded Image. This book was originally a series of lectures for his students at Oxford explaining the medieval model, what we might call the medieval worldview. Lewis ends by saying that while the medieval approach to nature has the disadvantage of not being true, it would be misleading to say the medievals thought the universe to be like that, but we now know it to be like this. Part of what we now know is that we cannot, in the old sense, know what the universe is like, and no model we can build will be, in that old sense, like it. He says that he's not advocating for return to the medieval model, but we should respect all models and idolize none. Further, he sees the acceptance of a given model at a given time as driven by the prevailing psychology, what he calls a taste in universes, as much as by observation of nature. He says, it's not impossible that our own model will die a violent death, ruthlessly smashed by an unprovoked assault of new facts. But I think it is more likely I think it's more likely to change when and because far-reaching changes in the mental temper of our descendants demand that it should. Note how different this is from the Biologos proponents who think that the current model of origins is not really going to die, and from the ID proponents who are trying to marshal that unprovoked assault of new facts that Lewis thinks is unlikely to cause change. Um, Lewis continues. <clears throat> 
the new model will not be set up without evidence, but the evidence will turn up when the inner need for it becomes sufficiently great. It will be true evidence, but nature gives most of her evidence and answer to the questions we ask her. Here, as in the courts, the character of the evidence depends on the shaper of the examination, and a good cross-examiner can work wonders. He will not indeed elicit falsehoods from an honest witness, but in relation to the total truth in the witness's mind, the structure of the examination is like a stencil. It determines how much of that total truth will appear and what pattern it will suggest. The picture Lewis is here painting is of scientists who are predominantly influenced by the spirit of an age rather than by an objective examination of data. He even illustrates this principle using evolution. The idea of development and progressive improvement was around in popular thought well before Darwin. This at least suggests that Lewis doesn't think science tells us what the world is really like. He portrays science as a follower rather than a leader in thought. Uh, lest I leave you thinking that we ought to downgrade science, which is a pretty big part of our campus and what I do for a living, um, I should point out that I don't think Lewis is entirely right about science. He is right, I think, that scientists are human and therefore influenced by other ideas. We are never totally objective. But that doesn't mean we can't have any objectivity. Um, a big part of science is trying to root out our biases. This is why we do double-blind placebo-controlled experiments. It's not perfect, but I think the situation is a lot better than Lewis portrays it. Finally, I think it's important to uh, remember that the point of agreement all around is valuing apologetics. I can appreciate what BioLogos is trying to do in creating a space for people who are convinced evolutionists to be Christians. And on the ID side, I've always liked the stories of scrappy scientists who no one believed making good in the end. So I think what they're doing is interesting and worth keeping an eye on, even if they haven't gotten much traction uh, in the mainstream. But I also think Lewis is right that this shouldn't be a divisive issue. The word apologetics is derived from the Greek apologia, a reasoned defense. In its Christian usage, it's often connected to Paul's exhortation in 1 Peter 3 to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Um, defense here is apologia. What immediately follows, though, is yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Anyone who follows Christian debates on evolution knows that they're not always done with gentleness and respect, um, but recognition of common goals like apologetics might be one way for Christians who disagree on many other things to respect each other, even within their disagreements about how to reach those goals. Thank you. Thank you.